Okay. Hi, my name is Amanda Finley. I am here with COVID-19 Long Haulers Discussion Group. We are doing our town hall on pandemics past, present, and future. And lovely internet friends, introduce yourselves. Go for it, John. Hi there. I am uh, John Aldredi. I'm a virologist by training. I've spent a good chunk of my career working for multinational companies and uh, market opportunity assessments and product acquisition and uh, have decided to do that for myself many years ago and a serial entrepreneur now in the mostly in the infectious disease diagnostic space. Fantastic. Thank you. RG. Hi, I'm RG Chakravarti. I'm also an entrepreneur and scientist. Um, my background is uh, the pharma industry. I've been in pharma for now two decades. Um, I've worked on a wide variety of different uh, projects for preclinical and clinical um, oncology primarily moving molecules in the clinic and uh, and that sort of thing. I've worn a lot of different hats, been a cell biologist, been a biochemist, as well as uh, built and run mathematical modeling groups. Uh, the reason I'm here today has nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, but, you know, when COVID started, we, um, meaning my team at Fractal Therapeutics, which is the company I run, um, out of sheer frustration with sort of what, our, what was happening to our lives, we sort of blundered into publishing, doing research and publishing on COVID because we, you know, weren't, weren't fully on board with what was being said um, and none of it sort of added up to us. So we have over the past two, uh, three and a half years, uh, published a couple of dozen different papers predicting various different aspects of what has come to, you know, come to pass. Unfortunately, we predicted the virus would very rapidly evolve to evade immunity. We predicted that reopening things with a vaccine only strategy would lead to variant driven rebounds. We predicted that reopening schools would lead to waves of disease and um, you know, we predicted that natural immunity would be would be done, you know, done and dusted within six months for many people. So I wish I wish I lived in a world where everything we said was wrong, uh, but instead, you know, here we are today. So that's my introduction. Thank you. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> well, let's uh, start right off here with number one. Let's define what a pandemic is and what endemic means. I'm deferred to the virologist. <laughs> Open flow. Well, <laughs> uh, sure, no problem. I mean, you know, from my perspective, a pandemic is uh, the worldwide and widespread occurrence of uh, an infectious disease, right? So, in this case, it's over the uh, the whole world. Uh, in, in, in the last pandemic that we suffered from that, endemic uh, tends to be much more regionally defined. And uh, just as a note, uh, as a virologist, I'll say, you know, we did have historical large scale microbiological events like the bubonic plague, but uh, we're unlikely to see that again, just because we have antibiotics and better hygiene. So uh, I typically think of uh, future pandemics as being viral in nature. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, point. I, had, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I, I do agree with you. So um, I, I generally agree with everything you said, I think, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I do play one from time to time on social media because we published a lot of uh, papers on uh, the epidemiology on COVID, unfortunately. Um, I say unfortunately because I would much rather not ever have been doing that. Uh, but, but the fact is that, you know, pandemics are defined by unpredictability. So the epidemiological meaning is essentially if you have an RT of around one, um, which means that you know, each person who infects, who gets infected, infects one other person, and it's kind of stably around one, uh, that'll be considered endemic. But if you have things flaring up all the time globally, unpredictably, you're in a pandemic. So we are, for example, right now in a pandemic, as the WHO correctly points out, because COVID is evolving rapidly, SARS-CoV-2 is evolving rapidly, uh, and the uh, RT is subject to change um, with every new wave. This is a, just a, a side note that just popped into my head. Um... There's a high school in Kansas City right now. They have four, they reported four more cases of tuberculosis in the same high school. Wow. We've got that going on right now. Yeah. Um, yeah and historically, um, I don't know if, if you want to, if you want, if you want to add anything to this, like with bubonic plague, Spanish flu, HIV, or even avian flu. Um, I was actually in Southeast Asia not long after avian flu was started, it, crossing into Cambodia, you had to sign a form saying you did not have bird flu and I was like then they made you pay twenty dollars and I was like I'm like no I don't that's not a thing <laughs> I'm not kidding, like 20 bucks but 
I don't know, but what, what do you think we've learned from specifically HIV and avian flu outbreaks and pandemics uh, or evidence? Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting question, which I don't think I can uh, yeah. appropriately answer because I come from it from a almost a pure virologist right. perspective in, in the research side. So I definitely would be here interesting to hear what you have to say, Rajiv. So you know, I think you know maybe uh, broadening that that question out a little bit. You know, from from my perspective, I think the lessons that we've taken away from past pandemics uh, for public health for this particular pandemic have been, unfortunately. Uh, not all too good, right? So the Spanish flu, for example, is when people think of, when people thought of the word pandemic before this pandemic, I think everybody's mind would always go to 1918, 1919. Right. And so what happened was there was a lot of indexing when COVID hit, there was a lot of indexing of, oh, it's like, it's a pandemic. So Spanish flu is a pandemic. So it would be like the Spanish flu, right? And so then it was like, oh, this, the flu had, you know, a few different waves and you know, as each wave uh, subsided, then the whole thing was done and dusted. So, you know, no problems there. We just have to flatten the curve. So the whole mindset came from influenza. And it came from a disease that gives you lasting, you know, lasting immunity on the order of two to three years, not on the order of months. Uh, and so that that whole framework was was lifted from influenza and applied inappropriately to COVID. Uh, and very early on, we did, you know, some work, which we didn't publish because by the time we had already got and other people had pointed it out quite well, which was this time is different. Yeah. So COVID had a much higher R naught right out the gate. So it was infecting far more people. Each infected person was infecting far more people. It was clearly airborne to anyone who was paying attention as early as February of 2020. Um, and you know there was good reason to suspect just from straight common sense alone, anyone who's ever had a cold knows that you don't have lifelong immunity to coronaviruses. So common sense alone said using influenza was the wrong framework. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, many of those, many of the missteps for public health came from repeatedly trying to shoehorn COVID into that Spanish flu framework. Uh, if you take a look at the bigger picture of pandemics historically, uh, there were many lessons to have been drawn, right? I mean, you have pandemics that killed 90% of people that, that they ever, you know, that they infected. Um, there's many examples of, of that in the historical literature. Uh, you have plagues that went through cities and, and basically laid them to waste. So the, the idea that, you know, you'd have a fixed bite or one-time bite is mistaken because, the, for example, with the bubonic plague, uh, Yersinia pestis, they don't develop lasting immunity to it. So you can, you know, they had, they would have multiple waves of, of plague sweeping through the same town, uh, killing a different chunk of people. Um, which over a good really period kind of time, of, too. Over a good yeah. period of time, exactly. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. seven years. Uh, the Black Death was seven years. If you look at plagues prior to that, and it's it's so poorly defined because it's it's not clear, you know, what exactly the plague was, what vi virus or what bacillus it was. We tend to assume it's all bubonic plague, but it could have been a variety of different things. If you look at plagues, be, you know, going back further into history, you have plagues like the Antonine Plague and, and the Justinian Plague that were like 15 years long. The Antonine Plague was 15 years long. Uh, the Plague of Justinian was eight years long. So these things can last for any variable amount of time. They can have multiple waves. Same, the same person can get infected multiple times during the pandemic. All of that was in the historical record. Yeah. But the only things we took away was by, you know, gosh, golly, if we can dodge the first wave, then maybe there'll be a little bit of stuff in the second wave, and then we'll have the exit wave and it'll be done. And, and to be clear, that's not what the scientific community was saying, but a bunch of people who were saying that suddenly became scientists, right? The experts sure, sure. weren't saying that, but the people who said that became experts. Right. We, yeah. we also missed a couple of lessons um, that if we took a look historically at what did work for populations in, in the Spanish flu, for example, uh, where we had people practicing masking or distancing or, uh, you know, good healthcare yeah. practices uh, who had a high likelihood of escaping, we just seemed to ignore that. Right, we didn't take those lessons. We were looking purely at the numbers and the timing because we just wanted to get over it quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that was distressing. That was a shame. I'm old enough that my great grandmother lived through the Spanish flu. Wow. And when I was very little, I, um, I asked her, you know, what was it like? And she was like, it was really boring. We were distant, <laughs> we were kind of locked down and it was really boring for a year and a half. We just didn't see anyone. And I remember thinking at that time that it's good that it was boring for her because if it hadn't been boring for her, I wouldn't have existed. Because exactly. um, she was very young at the time, and people in her age group got got hit the hardest. So this is uh, going back to the the R number. Um, 
the, the tuberculosis outbreak here in Olathe, Kansas, one student, they had to trace over 400 contacts. That, wow, that, that made me want to say, hey, let's get my kid out of school right now. Um, let's move on to this. Uh, what, uh, let's talk about what strategies were employed. What did and didn't work? So, I mean, to John's point, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about public health and you think about the, the whole concept of public health, a lot of it was driven by the desire to control pandemic grade diseases, right? So the whole concept of quarantine arose from the Black Death, right? So they would, you know, during the Black Death era, ships that came into Venice had to be in the harbor for 40 days. So I don't speak down about the pandemic. Caranta is... Um, is um, the, is the number of days essentially, um, and and so that was that was the origin of the term quarantine. Now, with that being said, you know, masking in during the um, masking during the um, Spanish flu, or for example, contact tracing, which originated not from a pandemic but from epidemic from cholera epidemics and typhoid epidemics. These were innovations that came in specifically for certain diseases. So, you know, when it comes to what worked or what didn't work. It's unfair to look, you know, to look all the way back and say, well, what public health strategies did they use in 1500 to control right. disease, right? Because what the public health strategy they used, quite frankly, was a whole bunch of people died and whoever yeah. survived had enough immunity. Uh, so that was really the public health strategy. Um, and it's it's not a recommended public health strategy for a modern society. But unfortunately, no. it's a strategy that we're choosing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, especially with a novel entity like SARS-CoV-2 was, um, again, as a virologist perspective, there are a couple of elements that we, I would look at, and these include things like infectivity, you know, and uh, versus virulence, right? So we have multiple different types of parameters that impact how a disease should be engaged and dealt with. And well, as far as I understood, at least in the initial beginnings of this, none of that uh, was approached. And just as an example, you could have a virus that spreads very rapidly, but has very little or no disease outcome, right? So that you want to respond to that differently than a virus that maybe doesn't spread as well, but is uniformly fatal. So, and, and we just had no way to differentiate what was happening. Uh, we just knew that people were being infected and trying to apply a you know, one size fits all response uh, to that in the beginning. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think from very early on, um, we knew, you know, we knew certain things about the virus. There was a lot of conflicting information. Some people were saying it was, you know, 2.5. Some people were saying it was 5.7, the r uh, and so on. Um, the early studies out of China uh, had a very high r 5.7. Then the Italian studies came in with a much lower r about two or three US studies were 2, 2, 2.5. With the benefit of hindsight, we, know, we now know why that was. There's a paper that we're putting out um, shortly that shows that if your contact tracing fails, it will result in an apparently low r so we had garbage contact tracing. So we had mm -hmm. a garbage ability to estimate the r mm -hmm. right? If you have voluntary, voluntary contact tracing, which is what we do in the US, uh, this paper of ours shows that it picks up about less than 1% of all transmission events. So contact tracing in the US was designed to do what public health in the US is designed to do, which is it's designed to make sure that people stay calm and keep going to the mall. So basically, they had broken contact tracing, leading to no detectable transmission events. So I remember, go I remember going on a flight in, I think it was the fall of 2021, and it, right, it said right there, and I was the, like almost one of the only people masked at that point. Uh, and it said right there, you know, it, it said there have been almost no cases of transmission detected on flights. And I'm thinking to myself, or anywhere else, because you guys have this voluntary tell us how you know, feel free to admit whether you transmitted it to anyone or not, style of contact tracing. I'm going to get this number wrong, uh, but I think that something in the range of, you know, when we were doing at-home testing, the amount of self-reporting that occurred was hovering around 14%, right? So, so effectively, I think the word you used was garbage. It, it was all garbage from the testing yeah. to the reporting the to the contact tracing and there was no way to get a handle on it and that ex extends to today we, yeah. we still have no handle on this yeah well, actually and, and i think i think the point is that um it's about what's unknown and it's about applying the precautionary principle mm -hmm. if you think about it as as sort of you know let's just take the 
should, when there's a when there's a range of uncertainty, um, should you plan with the best case scenario or the worst case scenario? Just use the analogy of a hurricane. Yeah. Right? Nobody ever says yes that thing's a tropical storm, but there's a lot of uncertainty about whether it's going to hit us or whether it's going to hit Mexico. So we're not taking any precautions. Right? If there's a cone of uncertainty. The, the closer it comes to you, the more precautions you take, the more carefully you are. No one, no one ever says, gee, that was a waste. We boarded up our windows and we didn't die. Um, so we were using best case estimates. There's there's a bunch of clowns out there, one of whom is John Ioannidis, uh, right? Who essentially said, well, this is, you know, we should be careful about uh, panic and sensationalism in February of uh, 2020. There was this, this other guy, Epstein, who, who had an article that he wrote. He said, we'll see 5,000 5, dead. Then a few weeks later, he corrected and he said, oh, it was a typo. I meant to see 50,000. And then after that, he, they corrected it one more time to say it was a typo. The typo had a typo in it and it should have been 500,000. And to his credit, he stopped after that. <laughs> uh, that was his worldwide to total. So, wow. you know, the point being that you you routinely saw best case scenarios being put forward in the media in a situation where there was a wide cone of uncertainty. And that to me is a complete failure of risk management. That's not how anyone rationally in their personal life or in, in public policy handles risk management. To, to add a counterpoint to that, because we, we dealt with this very specifically here uh, where, where I live, which happens to be on an island, the, you know, we, there are the pressures on the policymakers and decision makers, the public health officials from groups that are self-interested in economics, to put it plainly, uh, are incredibly powerful. So any of the discussion about caution was almost second to discussions about, well, how are we going to keep our island open? We need people to come and spend money, you know, yeah. and, and ignoring the effect of the exposure that would have on the, so the, ex, yeah. the effect of the exposure was much more harmful uh, yeah. during this pandemic yeah. than, than any of the precautionary measures we took. Uh, and so it's become clouded uh, right now in terms of how we can best manage this. Yeah, and it was a completely falsely dichotomous framing that yes. should we protect the economy or should we protect the health, people's health? Those who would trade public health for a robust economy uh, may soon find that they have neither. Exactly. And you, you simply can't have a robust economy with, without public health. We're Correct. seeing it right now. Um, they they suckered China into reopening in the name of the economy and the name in the name of growth. Look at how China has done this past year. Two million people died it's within horrific. a month. Yeah. It's yep. horrific. Yep. Yeah, it's, I, I can speak a little bit further to contact tracing. I was a contact tracer in Kansas City. We did not start until August 2020. The funding ran only through March 15th, and that was even after an extension. That's it. When I first yeah. got there, it was all on paper. We were entering yeah. the data into a program that fed it to the CDC. All of our work was on paper. And it, wow, it was a mess. It was a big mess. And it wasn't for lack of, it, the, the people in this office, they were just exhausted. Yeah. But yeah, we really failed with tracing. It's kind of sad because the people who were doing the tracing were doing it for the best of reasons. But the contact tracing data was being used for the worst of reasons. Yes. By simply designing a contact tracing paradigm where most transmission events were missed, it was it was nothing but window dressing. Mm -hmm. It allowed them to say schools were safe. It, it has allowed them to say hospitals are safe. It has allowed them to say airplanes are safe. Well, you know, well, shit, if everything is safe, then where are people getting it? Right. Licking doorknobs. I think that was what was. Yeah. <laughs> I um, guess, right? Or, yeah. or somehow it like spontaneously, you know, um, a spontaneous generation in, in people's homes. Yeah. Well, that, the, the one good thing about working there as a long hauler, by then I'd already started the support group, we had a symptom list. It had over 300 things on it. So when they pulled out that slide here, the five symptoms of COVID, I stood up and said, no, I want you to look at this. They passed it out to everyone who works in that health department. I've, whether they were answering the phone, contact tracer, uh, they uh, it it was it was nice to have that. It, it was the first time someone listened to me. We went through nothing with gaslight. Oh no, you're not still sick. Well, actually, we still really are. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think the thing you know coming back to your historical point, yeah. you know, is um, there's never been an event like this before, yeah. right? So if you think about it. In biblical times, people were afraid of leprosy. Yeah. 
So leprosy is easy to avoid in today's day and age, in theory. Mm -hmm. You don't really see leprosy pandemics for a simple reason that, you know, somebody has leprosy, you can, you can quarantine them, you can isolate them, you can treat them. Mm -hmm. So easy to avoid, right? You fast forward a little bit into, um, you know, into, the, into medieval times. And what was the disease people worried about? It was the bubonic plague. All right, fine, go have a shower and kill off the rats in your house. And bubonic plague is no longer an issue, right? Uh, that's all it took, like clean underwear, frankly, was, was the end of that, right? Uh, you move a little further and it's cholera and it's like, please wash your hands before you, after you, you know, leave the bathroom or before you leave the bathroom or whatever, right? So easy to solve problems. Uh, but but it, we're now in an era, coming back to your point, John, that modern science um, has advanced to the point where we are hygienic and we, um, we know basic, the basics of, of epidemiology or we used to before this pandemic. So now, now we're up against a, a, an agent that is uh, aerosol bomb, right? So, so is influenza. But where things get trickier with COVID is it is asymptomatic frequently. So asymptomatic transmission accounts for a chunk of it, aerosol bomb, uh, super spreader driven. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, it is evolving very rapidly with short immunity. So that sort of devil's brew of traits, no, no pathogen in our history that we are aware of has had those traits. Right. A pathogen that yeah. has those traits can probably do a lot more damage than this one has done already. Absolutely. And, and I think that's the worry for the future uh, is an additional you know, SARS variant emerging, novel to this one even. Yeah. And, and from my standpoint, the, yeah, as a virologist, one thing that was absolutely fascinating to see is the ubiquitous uh, cells, the number of cells that this virus could infect just because of the type of receptor it was going after, right? Yeah. It, it, very unique uh, in that sense. And yeah. the fact that it had the ability to, uh, in, in its replication cycle, it, it, to introduce you know, mutations. Um, so it, it was a very fast spread, as you indicated. It was uh, it had a lot of characteristics that allowed it to be very dangerous to us, and I think I think we actually got pretty lucky. I'm not saying that globally because no. obviously there are millions of people affected by this, but I think the death rate could have been much worse had we not had the modern tools to go into the genomics to be able to work. Thank goodness the mRNA vaccine was poised, wasn't made for this specifically, but it was we were able to take advantage of it. And I think we saved a lot of lives that way. Uh, and yeah, it, it was I troubling think, to watch. I think I think the vaccines bought us some time. Yeah. Uh, I think we got lucky in that basically in 2021, 2021 was a better year than it could have been. Yeah. Right. That much, that much is for sure. Right. Um, it was definitely a lot better. You saw a glimmer of hope, modern science had finally kicked in. We had tools, we had monoclonal antibodies, we had vaccines. The vaccines were clearly suppressing serious disease. Um, and, you know, for, for a brief shining moment there, it looked like science was going to win. And so what did we do with that early lead, right? First quarter lead, right? We blew it. Squandered yeah. it. We squandered it. Yeah, and absolutely. so, you know, we had predicted um, the week of May 12th, we put out a paper, both of you may be familiar with, that said, if you reopen now and drop restrictions, you will get a variant fuel rebound. And then, I, you know, that same week, Biden was on TV going, if you have the vaccine, the pandemic is over for you. And, and I can't tell you how many of us wanted to just tear our hair out no, because we yeah, knew so. what, what that was going to do. <laughs> yeah, see? Yeah. Um, it does, people. So, so yeah, and, and we knew that that was exceptionally poor stewardship of the vaccine. It was the most yeah. anti-vaccine you could have done is left the vaccine on its own to basically control the disease because it. we knew right then from work that we had done previously that the vaccine was not going to be able to do that. The immune system was not enough, um, but yeah, we, we blew it. And so it, yeah. that, you know, basically not only deep six the vaccines at the time, it deep six the, the monoclonals. And if you're watching closely uh, with Paxlovid, there's all, at this point, roughly one third of people who had COVID have had Paxlovid. I'll bet you a buck within a year, Paxlovid stops working. Um, it's, it's moving fast enough that, you know, if you look at what's happening with the viral protease, you know, depending on how widely Paxlovid is prescribed, one thing that could save us is that it's too damn expensive. No one takes it anymore. But if people keep taking it widely, Paxlovid will will basically be once again agree with that rendered input. Uh, agree with that. We we have precedent for that with HIV, so that's not exactly. It's not yeah. going to be surprising to see that. Exactly. 
Yep. Got Joaquin so coming I think in. Joaquin oh, is joining. Yeah. And while, while he's coming in, hey, Joaquin, can you hear me? So coming in, okay. And while he's coming in, uh, this is something I wanted to touch on. We, we, it, May, May 11th, apparently the pandemic ended. Wahoo. How, how do pandemics actually end? Well, so just to clarify, May 11th, of this year. the Biden White House began to think yeah. the pandemic was over. Yes. The WHO doesn't, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So, so a belief form, shall we say, in certain political circles that the pandemic was over on May 11th. Um, but, you know, pandemic is as, you know, it's not a feeling. Uh, a pandemic is not an opinion. A pandemic is a defined epidemiological event. So if you have a disease that is global and keeps relapsing and remitting unpredictably, you're in a pandemic. Uh, this pandemic will honestly end in one of two ways, right? Uh, either one, we will deal with, we will bring SARS-CoV-2 to heal, or two, it will bring us to heal, right? Let it run for another 20 years. Uh, I'm, I have no doubt that there will be a subpopulation of survivors who are highly resistant to, to the virus. But you keep rolling the dice on viral evolution, there's nothing, nothing that guarantees that the next variant that comes about doesn't have a dramatically increased IFR. There's many different ways in which this virus can access a higher IFR that have to do with trophism. And I'll let the virologist uh, uh, jump in at any time. But you know, the, the way in which we get infected, we got infected with Omicron, we were lucky because Omicron was just a little bit more benign. It didn't go into the lungs as deeply. Uh, if you had a variant that spread like Delta, uh, sorry, that had Omicron spread, but Delta's uh, lethality, you'd have a lot fewer Americans alive today. And, you know, I, I took absolutely right. This is going to play out for decades uh, before we have any indication of how it's actually going to work out. I, I am of the belief, uh, I'm optimistic, because I do think we'll be able to work on better vaccines, quite honestly, that will offer longer immunity. But but that is... 100%, just, yes. But, yeah, it's a, I'm not but, saying that but I'm not saying as the problem of today, is not solvable. Of yeah. course, but but as of today, that doesn't exist, right? And there's yeah, no yeah. guarantee either. So, so the the issue uh, that I see exactly what you just articulated is that we don't we're not handling, we're ignoring the problem. We're pretending yes. it's gone because, quite frankly, I could go to any store here and, and there nobody's masking. A fair number of them yeah. will be vaccinated, and they all believe that it's over. Uh, and and part of the issue, from my standpoint here, the technologist speaking, is the only way we can help control this is to understand what's happening in the population. And if we yeah. stop diagnosing and reporting, yeah. we have absolutely no way to understand what's happening. We have no ability to absolutely. make any decisions, policy or healthcare or otherwise. Uh, and that's one of the more frustrating things for me. Uh, and, and we've been working on a way, uh, that, again, as a technologist and recognizing this, you know, uh, the first, the first I became aware of microbiological events being of interest to national security, say, or population security was after 9-11. And that, I think that's when we really sort of collectively understood that there are existential threats out there, not just airplanes, but things like, you know, plague and anthrax and other things. So the government really began to start working on programs to prevent these things from happening. And the, for me, the biggest take home message after what, living through this pandemic seeing what types of technologies were deployed is I am appalled that in the 20 plus years since 9-11, nothing has really changed. There, there is no you know, widespread, easy to use mechanism for diagnosing an emerging disease or reporting yeah. even. There are or different yeah, systems yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. There are different yeah. systems for different yeah. stakeholders, but none of it's integrated. Yeah. So we, we as a population, unless you're plugged into those systems, we walk around blind. I, I yeah. benefit from knowing things, and so does Arjit and you, Amanda, and uh, Joaquin, and others who pay attention or have special access. But for the majority of people, we just don't know what's actually happening, and that's that's the biggest letdown uh, for me of my public health infrastructure in this country. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just to to come back on on this because I'm sure we'll we'll jump jump into what could be done to, to solve the problem in a little bit. But I do want to point out that right now the strategy is ignoring it and ignoring yep, it. Yep. Ignoring it can only lead to one or two outcomes. Either one, we will wipe this out, you know, by sheer luck, by you know, Deus Ex Machina happens and the virus suddenly disappears. 
you know, and and if you believe that, and there's a bridge in Brooklyn I'm willing to sell you. Um, or two, something will happen that people were not expect, quote unquote, not expecting. That will be outside the bounds of what society can withstand and keep functioning. So societal collapse is on the table. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's very much a deal risk. And I think we're playing with fire here because in fact, we're not even playing with fire. The house is on fire and we're ignoring it. So if you let it burn, uh, at some point it will stop burning. That that's kind of the house burning to the ground is also resolution of the crisis in a certain way. Um, so sooner or later, I think what will have to happen is it, that this will have to be dealt with. The one piece of good news is that the, that the problem is actually quite easy to deal with if you want to deal with it. We don't have to accept endless COVID. We don't have to accept endless infection. There are ways to solve this problem that are quite affordable for the price of, you know, one tranche of weaponry to whatever our favorite, uh, you know, uh, foreign ally is this year. We could significantly bring this thing to heel. And and I just the skeptical me. Uh, I would love to hear your opinion about this. I don't ever see that happening. Uh, honestly, I I know how it easy it is. Uh, the, the solutions yeah. are practical and cheap. Uh, in it, regardless of you know the savings that we get for the positive outcomes, the, the solutions are cheap. I just don't see it happening. Um, only because this whole process so, becomes so politicized and so, individual. I think it makes it difficult. Yeah. So, so you call yourself a skeptic, but I think you're an optimist. <laughs> I think you're being optimistic um, because there are two things that can happen at this point that are on the table, right? And one of them is that long COVID piles up to the point where society cannot function. Exactly. It's very much on the table, right? If you look mm -hmm. at the numbers, we've done the modeling. Uh, if you look at the numbers, um, if only 31% of people recover after long COVID after one year, vaccines only reduce long COVID risk by 50%. And everybody gets COVID once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. You know, you do the math. Almost yeah. everyone will have long COVID. Yeah. So, and in that situation, and long COVID, people think, oh, you know, it's an ex it's a nagging cough, or maybe I'm sleepy yeah. the next day. But Amanda, share with us a little bit after I finish this, well, uh, what long COVID looks like. Yeah, the, let me tell you the 300 symptoms and the people who have died also from long COVID. And I've, it's watching them die over the period of a year was horrific. It was traumatic. People, people in their 30s and 40s, no prior medical history dying of heart failure. That's not okay. That's not normal. And it, I think one of the things that gets me the most is when people start blaming it on the vaccine. Oh, let me tell you something. I started this group. There are 15,000 people in it. One third of them were sick in March 2020 alone. They are the sickest still. They were sick before vaccines. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. These are the people who are dying the most quickly out of our demographic. Yeah, and, and I have heard it said that, oh, but the virus is changing, it's milder now, it, there's less long COVID. No, and, that is not and what I'm And the way I look at it is it's cumulative. So even if your rate of production of long COVID with each successive uh, infection goes down because the virus is, quote unquote, becoming milder or because immunity is, quote unquote, piling up, uh, you'll still end up with everybody getting long COVID just a yeah. little slower. Second point is, there's no reason for the virus to go easy on us because most of the transmission happens in the first five days. So there's no fitness advantage for the virus for having reduced long COVID. If you believe that long COVID will decrease over time because of evolution, then you don't understand how evolution works. That's absolutely true. And, I'm, and, what, and when they say, oh, we're seeing less long COVID, that's actually not the case at all. Yeah. Because we're not reporting. That is not what I see yeah. coming into my group. Almost everyone still, and the rates have just been like something at the beginning of the year, it started sky, it was level for quite some time that it started skyrocketing. Around the holidays, it has not stopped. Almost all of them are either March 2020 or they're Omicron. This mm -hmm. is, I, it doesn't matter how mild it is, you can be asymptomatic and still develop long COVID. Yeah. It's, and it's just disturbing that the sickest people with the worst lungs have to do the most yelling about this. Yeah. And uh, and the truth of the matter is, you know, long COVID is only, that's one one dark outcome, right? Yeah. That society collapses as a result of long COVID. It's entirely yeah. possible. It is. Uh, I had a tweet thread a while back talking about the ECT scores. Thank you. There are so many different, if you look, there are so many different metrics by which um, it's very clear that in 22 and 23, 
things have been falling apart. Um, and, you know, there's only going to be so long that that the minimizers can blame lockdowns on this or vaccines, you know, this on vaccines. It, it only goes so far. Or the second possible outcome, as you brought up, John, is that you have a black swan um, variant or what we call a gray swan variant, which is basically something that comes in that's highly immune evasive. And we've shown in, in a recent paper of ours that such a variant would not only be immune evasive. So if it's immune evasive, immune evasiveness would not only give it a high IFR, meaning ability to kill people, but also a high R0, ability to spread. So in fact, the most immune evasive variants will tend to be the most highly spreading and also the deadliest. So that's a bad combination, especially when the, your entire strategy consists of lying to the public about whether there is a problem or not. Yes. And this, uh, this kind of, I wanted to segue into this. This is something near and dear to my heart. How can we address cultural beliefs about what causes disease and what addresses it? And where have we succeeded and failed? Uh, I don't I don't know how best to answer that question. I, I will say uh, just a personal anecdote. Um, when I was living in Palo Alto several years ago, I, I had the benefit of living across the street from a nurse who, who had a PhD. Um, and her whole thing was sort of cultural nursing, cross-cultural nursing, right? And so I became acutely aware through her uh, of the need to be able to communicate with different groups of people yeah. in ways that are meaningful to them. What I can tell you is, at least from my experience, because I'm completely Western medicine trained, you know, that's my whole, my whole experience, you know, working at institutions uh, that are nationally renowned, is that none of that sneaks into how we deal with pandemics or events like this. It's all, it's all very cut and dry. This is how we do it. This is how we report it. This is what needs to happen. Uh, and I see that, you know, living again on an island and culturally, we have special issues that need to be addressed. We have a lot of multi-generational housing, for example, right? So it's not easy to just go into a room and lock yourself up, you know, and wait out 10 days like you might do if you live in Connecticut, for example, right? It's just, there's a big difference. So I don't know how to answer your question. I don't have a lot of experience in it, but I do, I do recognize it as being important. Yeah, I don't have much of a formal training there, except um, true story. Um, one lecture I, I attended in medical anthropology when I was six years old. Um, oh so it was kind of funny. We were I was uh, staying with staying with uh, my um, aunt and uncle, and she was my, my aunt was studying at UCLA. So no babysitter. So I show up for this lecture, and what they were doing was they were showing movies of um, people in the Andes and how they dealt with disease, right? So I remember coming away from the thing, wow, you know, people are really, you know, so so backward in, in their thinking or whatever, right? It's like it didn't even as a as a little kid, it didn't make sense to me that someone would think that there were demons in their head or whatever. You know, it, it was very easy as a little kid to say, well, I'm sure all that thinking, you know, all that thinking is is just wrong, right? But it's not wrong. Um, as you grow up, you realize it's it's actually everybody has their own explicatory frameworks for how the world works, and you have to be able to connect with those. So Unfortunately, a lot of the people who are the most uh, susceptible to the to the vaccine sort of um, the anti-vax, for example, philosophies and the anti-vax uh, messages, are the same people who are into wellness. Who you know, five five ten years ago. So, we've created a pool of people in this country who, because of our educational system, are vulnerable to to uh, misinformation, and by ignoring that and by pretending it doesn't exist. And by the same time gaslighting us about COVID, what's happened is it's sort of this perfect storm where a lot of public health as a, as a field and a lot of science is being discredited right now. There's people out there who actively believe that the, that the vaccine is the problem. And there's a large number of them. And it's easy for us to have contempt for them and say, well, what a bunch of idiots. They're not a bunch of idiots. We have mishandled this. This, yeah. is, you know, this, is, a, mm. this is a failure on the part of public health. Yeah, and this is um, and this is uh, this is one of the reasons I love medical anthropology. It was some of my favorite coursework when I was in college. Uh, we had to read a book called "The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down" by Anne Batterin. It's the story of a Hmong refugee family. Um, they had they had to leave Laos. They were in a Thai refugee camp when their daughter was born. And she was born with a very serious seizure disorder. Now the family it, in their culture. Uh, once a child is born, you take the placenta and you bury it under, you bury it on, on, your, on the land around your home. 
And if you, if, when you do that, that's what seals that, that person's spirit to their, like, to their soul. They didn't do that. And they just assume, oh, well, she's having these seizures because we didn't get to do this thing. They land, they run up in Merced, California. This is during the 80s. Hmong at the time, it's not a written language. Uh, and they spoke no English, so that there was no, there was no literacy involved. Um, but they were up against very, uh, really, really good pediatricians with very good intentions who did not listen to their cultural beliefs. And it, it ended up in the death of this little girl. Um, and that really, that was powerful for me. So when I went forward, especially working in hospice, like I was telling you before, um, it, it, I, I try to, if I know the language, I'll try to read that family in that language. I, I called up a Lao family one day, Sabai Di. The son's like, you're Lao? No, 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 I'm, I'm very white. Uh, do, oh, you speak Lao? <laughs> yeah. But that, it was just sort of a signal to let them know we're going to honor and respect your beliefs. How can we work together on this? And I think that element is really missing from our public health strategies. Let's see. Joaquin. Hey, Joaquin. Yeah, hey, Joaquin, introduce your merry self. Hi, everyone. Sorry, um, I was running late, so I apologize. Uh, and then I had some uh, audio uh, issues. Um, so I'm Joaquin Beltran. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Amanda. Yeah. And uh, good to see you, John and RG. Um, yes, and um, my, my background is in um, um, software engineering. It, it's in it's in politics. It's in organizing. Oh, we lost him. And, I'm sorry. Oh, we lost you there for a sec. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I hope I hope my uh, internet is okay. Um, and so I, I've been working on the pandemic, um, trying to help people implement better policies to protect um, their communities. Uh, since March of 2020, um, I authored a, a Green Zone Act. I've um, uh, I founded ActionCareEquity.org. I'm also the founder of Speak Up America. Um, and so right now I've been working on trying to get masks back into healthcare settings. Um, and uh, we've, we've, had, we've had some progress, hopefully some more progress in the, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate everything that you've done, Amanda. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you too. We've worked together on some of these things in the past. Yeah. So, uh, so I just appreciate you so much. Okay, but likewise, you have, he's, he has been out there every day for over six months trying to literally protesting to get masks back in healthcare in LA. Um, and he's starting to see the fruits of that labor. Which is it's, cool. it's beyond, I don't know if, if ironic is the right word. I don't even know how to describe it. The fact that we have to have a conversation about masks and healthcare <laughs> yeah. is inconceivable to me. That's for yeah. another discussion, but. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, I, I tell people it's the most reasonable protest in the world, right? <laughs> masks in healthcare settings during an airborne pandemic, right? And then people are like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's yeah. beyond me, right? A, a lot of this is politicized, unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, we have decision makers who um, are not using basic uh, fundamental science even um, in their mm -hmm. approach uh, during an ongoing airport pandemic. So there, there's a whole denialism there. Um, that we even are in a pandemic, unfortunately, and so that's that's part of this this thing where politicians want to claim success um, as as the issue continues and and grows because as we know, more transmission, more mutations, more variants um, that are perhaps more immune evasive, more severe, more transmissible. You know, it's just um, it's just the uh, it's, it's an obvious thing, right? So. Um, I'm I'm with you right there, John. It makes it makes no sense. Yeah, it's a mission accomplished moment, right? I mean, it you is. can you can you can land on aircraft carriers all you want, but in the end, you have to win the war. Yeah. So, uh, so the banner alone doesn't doesn't do anything. Well, this, this feeds into the next question rather well. How do our responses differ globally? And we have seen that there were some countries that did better, and then they failed spectacularly after they did better. <laughs> I and mean, I think at this point, there's a global consensus, right? Everybody is in full gaslight mode. Yeah. And again, uh, my my point being that there's going to be one of two ways in which this, this uh, you know, I, I would say there's one of two ways in which it can fall apart, right? Either one, you have long COVID piling up to the point where society is essentially not able to function, 
or do you get that black swan variant? And we, um, you know, the, the paper that we uh, we have in review right now is looking at that. And essentially, you could end up with these really eye popping outcomes. Um, and if that doesn't happen, unfortunately, yes, there is another outcome possible, which is that it just skates in under, you know, under what is what society can tolerate. And I think the people who are pushing this outcome, you know, who are pushing this gamble, are pushing this gamble in hopes that essentially it skates in, you know, it shaves off 10 years of life expectancy, but we learn to live with it, right? They're basically trying to get us to accept a reduced life expectancy, reduced, um, essentially, a reduced level of public health in exchange for nothing, yeah. nothing. There's no benefit on, there's no upside to that. Uh, cheap TVs at Costco. I mean, that's that's all I can. They won't be I that cheap anymore, to. right? Because what will happen is you'll. They start... don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's you sort know, of the it's, promise. It's, right, right. That's the, I mean, that's the promise. I mean, you know, it's like that old joke, right? The guy jumps out of the the window and on the seventy second floor of the Empire State, and he's hurtling, plummeting downwards, and the uh, uh, Archangel Gabriel comes up to him and says, "Hey, you need help?" And he says, "Nah, so far so good." I don't know. It's, uh, we're going to kind of address that. What crucial lessons? Uh, let's skip. I'm going to skip. I'm going to go down here. How do we take stock of where people stand? Where do we stand? And how do we take stock of that at this point? What are some strategies you think we could employ or should employ? That's a tough one. How do we do this? <laughs> where do we start? Gonna, where do we I'm going to take it easy. Oh, yeah. Go, go for it, John. I'm sorry, I'll take an easy way out here because uh, all of the issues that have, are being described with the current pandemic, notwithstanding, uh, my purpose professionally right now is looking at the next pandemic, right? And uh, so so there are a lot of issues, and I hope uh, both Joaquin and Rajit speak to this, but uh, I want to see what we can do for the next pandemic. I, I'd actually, if we, if we got hit, and the periodicity of pandemics, of course, are, you know, coming faster and faster thanks to yeah. globalization and travel and moving into ecosystems we should be eating everything under the sun that moves. Um, but uh, I would like to think that we could better address the next pandemic. Yeah. I'm not so sure we could survive another one like we just had doing the same things that we just did. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know that I can answer your question, Amanda, yeah. specifically. And actually, let's skip on down. Let's go ahead and tackle that. How do we monitor for the next pandemic? And do we have the tools or the fortitude for that? The technology exists. I mean, <laughs> literally everything exists to do it. We just, I think, yeah. as a society, lack the will. Uh, so we, and, and you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say this. This is my personal opinion. Uh, I'm a big believer, have been a big believer in the CDC. I have many colleagues who work there or worked there. Uh, it's become a political entity. It's useless in the public health sector. It shocks me to say that. Uh, and um, so we need a way as a society, independent of the complexities of trying to manage relationships with the rest of the world, but we need a way for our United States uh, to have a better public health system. And I'm not so sure the government is the way to do it. So I, I can't I can't speak much more to that because we're we're doing things that I can't speak to at the moment, but but that's a big concern of mine. So I I do still see that as an optimistic framing. I think it's analogous in my mind to you know where in on you know January nineteen forty two and Pearl Harbor just happened and uh, and we say well you know the government failed, uh, so it's time for people to buy their own anti aircraft guns. That's one solution. It's not a good solution. Um, to me, there is such a thing as uh, governments exist for a reason. And the people who have been the most opposed to public health playing a strong role in this pandemic have in their, in their sights something much bigger than public health. They have the, the essential social contract between people and their government in their sights, right? Today, as a result of COVID, as a result of the mishandling of COVID by two administrations, we're in a situation today where in the next pandemic, they will not quarantine. They will not, they cannot contact trace. They will not test. Right. They right. essentially, all of the tools that a public health professional goes into their profession, having learned about in school, uh, no longer work. And, we'll be you know, and, and will not work at a societal yeah. level. So public health, what, you know, what 
past pandemics did for public health in a constructive sense, this pandemic has done for public health in a destructive sense. We had a paper in the fall of 2020 that said, it, whose title was Individually Optimal Outcomes will be can be collectively disastrous in the management of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that's where we are today, right? Um, you can't solve this individually it, any more than you can solve, you know, an airstrike on, you know, a surprise airstrike by handing everybody service to MSLs. It can't be done. There's, there's a reason governments exist. And so the fact that we have decided that, you know, I mean, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that COVID was a failure it, and it continues to be a failure. Um, people have to be held accountable in the CDC. People have to be held accountable within yeah. public health because it they didn't do their job. When public health is advocating for infection, uh, find a different job, please. Agree, so agree totally. I just 100% uh, agree the government is, is there for a reason and these institutions exist for a very specific reason. They did fail us, and I'm having a hard time uh, as a professional engaging institutions like the CDC, understanding when the reign of terror will end, when they become unpoliticized, right? Because then, yeah. then we can only then can we begin to utilize them for their true functions. Uh, at this moment in time, they're they are completely useless. So in effect, we've yeah, been right. we've been left to deal with this ourselves, yeah. as as groups, I guess, communities and individuals. And as you pointed out accurately, that's just not, that's not tenable. That's not um, tenable. Yeah. It's just not tenable. So, so I'll just leave it at that, yeah. <laughs> I'd be very yeah, interested to hear from you, Joaquin, not... about policy in this, in this phase. Mm -hmm. The role of policy, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the ironic part is the best way to prepare for the next pandemic is to handle the current pandemic really well, right? Yes. Like that's just right. it, that's just it. Right. Um, if we handle the pandemic we currently have, right? If we um, provide other resources for every building, right? So school, yes. business, nonprofit, for profit, whatever, every building to have cleaner air, you already reduce the likelihood or risk of transmission greatly, right? And so that has a huge community impact. Um, having N95s um, ubiquitously available having a PCR testing, which is, you know, is, um, has higher accuracy, uh, ubiquitously available, um, right? Um, having uh, the infrastructure for genomic uh, uh, surveillance, um, right? I mean, these are all obvious things, right? And so it would control the current pandemic. I mean, we, we would control this thing, right? Um, if we did all those things and doable, right? And also, non-imposing right if you just if you provide the resources for building upgrades for fresher air that's not imposing if you provided free mass that's not imposing right free high quality mass right n95s can 95s kf94s all those um right the genomic surveillance the the testing right that is on non-imposing and that would have a huge 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 impact right from the get-go and then you maintain that right you maintain that infrastructure um then you know you stop any future pandemics before they get started, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so that's I, I think you know kind of why we're not doing that is is politically uh, yeah. motivated because um, we are in a perpetual election cycle, and so you know Biden came in and I I was on staff for Biden and I'm very uh, I feel betrayed on, on a lot of things, you know, what's happening with um, uh, the pandemic, what, what's happening um, um, in, in Gaza as well. And so um, and what's happening on climate, right? So there's a lot of things there. Uh, but what happens is these politicians come in with these promises um, and the solution that they're trying to solve is a PR one and not the actual problem. Yes, exactly. right? And so they're trying to solve the, the PR uh, problem and, and 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 so and so they solved that by trying to. Uh -oh. oh, oh no, we lost him! Shoot! Oh no, <laughs> we'll be back. At the thesis of his point, yeah. Right. Well, like, yeah. One one. I don't know if you caught this this week or yesterday, day before. Uh, there was a there's a bill that people are signing on to, like senators. Uh, basically saying no more. They're making mask mandates illegal. Yeah. And some of the people who signed on to that so, were Tim Kaine, who was a long hauler, Amy Klobuchar, 
you know, a whole list of others. So I think, I think here's the thing. I think ma- mandates in general, you know, Joaquin's point about non-imposing is an important one. Yes, mandates in is. general are a very hard sell. Yes. But don't forget that the virus will do a lot of the heavy lifting for anybody who, who is making the argument that COVID is bad. The virus will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. All we need right now is we need the option to be able to opt out of that cycle of infection. In a paper that we put out earlier this year, preprint that's in review right now, actually, we showed that it's really, really difficult for the average person to avoid getting infected repeatedly, right? And so if there was a way for us to opt out of it, if we could take vaccines several times a year, if we had better indoor air quality, if we had better uh, access to masks, all the things that Joaquin talked about, it allows people to opt out of getting infected. And the minute a subpopulation can opt out of get, getting infected repeatedly, they will have better long-term outcomes. And that will create a free market incentive for people to avoid getting infected repeatedly. Yeah. So the right to opt out and the right to maintain COVID protections, if you should so choose, is something that we should be fighting for because that is really crucial, both for our own personal health and sanity, but also from the standpoint of, of moving the needle uh, in terms of public opinion. Yeah. And it's not, it's by no means CRT. A bill could come by tomorrow making masks, in, uh, you know, banning masks. Yeah. Every, all the or people like, talking about personal freedom will will then yeah. go and, and push to ban masks. Go ahead. Yeah, or, or diagnostics or reporting or, diagnostics, or, or, yeah. or whatever. All or, of it. or any of this. Yeah. So fighting for the right to opt out is a, is a critical, like essentially is a critical activity uh, that people who are interested in avoiding getting infected repeatedly should sort of be invested in. And so it's not so much about policing who's wearing masks and who's not, but protecting your right to mask is a really crucial thing. Yeah. Among other things, right? I'm going to skip down here to number 12. Um, what tools do we have now that we did not have before COVID? Where can we go with this? I think for, I'm just, while you're thinking on that, I think the ability to organize online is the biggest tool we have. That's something we can do from yeah. the safety of our own homes. Um, and I, I mean, think. it's not all bad news, right? I think yeah. COVID has shown us that we've learned a lot from COVID, right? So I think the biggest thing is the conceptual understanding of aerosol-borne diseases. Yeah. We're much more savvy about aerosol-borne diseases now. We've been forced to acknowledge how they spread, and we've been forced to develop strategies. What Joaquin said you know, a few minutes ago, like that's an obvious, easy win, right? The, those kinds of things. What John talked about in terms of diagnostics, uh, it's coming from my own industry, better antivirals, better vaccines, better uh, treatments. The, all of these things are within the realm of the possible today. So e- in each of these phases, we've learned a lot, and there's a lot we can do in, you know, as I said, for the price of a tranche of weapons to our favorite allied country, uh, you could actually move the needle very far if you wanted to pandemic-proof this country. Yeah, and, and one of the benefits that I saw, which was actually absolutely mind-blowing to, to witness in real time, was how quickly uh, the hardcore molecular epidemiologists went to, to work on yeah. mapping genomic sequences and tracing, you know, lineages. Yeah. That was incredible. Yeah. And it's still incredible to watch uh, yeah. right it's now. And that, cool. that gave us yeah. so much insight, right, in, in how we can apply different tools to help mitigate uh, this virus. So big data, I think, was a big win yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I think we saw tools very early on um, with groups like Google who were setting up the, the testing centers, the drive through testing centers in California, and, and being able to uh, aggregate that data. The fact that they abandoned it completely was was mind blowing, but it, but it was an interesting yeah. uh, first start. I think it also uh, laid bare some very critical areas that we need to work on still uh, for for mitigating even this current pandemic and future pandemics. And that is, you know, all of the reporting. How do we do that uh, in a yeah. timely fashion? I mean, having to wait seventy two hours for a test result before you get on a plane is utterly yeah. ridiculous. Mathematically, it makes no sense. Uh, so reporting and testing, the testing infrastructure, the support infrastructure, uh, everything that goes along, how we distribute masks, how we distribute drugs if necessary, uh, yeah. all of that um, can be improved upon, improved upon. Yeah, I think I think it's kind of, it's an interesting situation, right? Because as a result of the last three or four years of the pandemic, we have never been better prepared to fight a pandemic in terms of technology, yeah. right? But we have never been worse prepared to fight a pandemic in terms of our attitude. It's as if the role of the public health organizations worldwide has been to midwife the birth of a brand new pathogen and drive its acceptance into human society. That's not public health's job. 
And so, you know, this sort of false dichotomy of, well, we're never going to exterminate it, we're never going to eliminate it, so we should just get it as many times as, as often. You can take that and run with it and, and you know, have polio parties. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So the far. idea that diseases are just intrinsically bad is something we have to reinstill in people. The idea that getting sick more often doesn't make you healthier is something we have to reinstill in people. Those are the, actually, those are the biggest barriers now. But again, I hate to put it this way, but the virus is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Yeah. Every single minimizer, every single COVID denier will come up with their own moment of reckoning sooner or later. Yeah, it's sad. And I see that coming into my group. Um, I, I, I could never say I told you so, but I can't tell you how many people have come into the group and they basically said it for me. They need the yeah. support. I get over here. Um, yeah, I mean, each of these people will have their own personal, you know, come to Jesus moment with this yeah. virus, and and that's what if that's it's what really it takes, helpful. that's what it takes. It, yeah, it, and it, it can't it, it can affect someone that you love. It's it, it's not until it affects them personally. Yeah, um, I'm gonna, but if the numbers are right, you know, yeah. there's only one way. It's a ratchet. There's only one way it can end. Yeah. Exactly. But but the technology exists on the flip side. Like this is a solvable problem. It is. It's it's totally solvable. We have the tools. I I had Mark Johnson on uh, like a month or two ago, talking wastewater surveillance. Um, that was that was really fascinating. You know, we've got the tools for this. Can we just can I just add a, a bit of a counterpoint to the tools? We have oh, the yeah. tools. I spent uh, yeah. I spent a good deal of part of my time during the pandemic. Uh, we. I'm a virologist in 2019, late 2019. I knew it was on our horizon. You don't close cities with millions of people without right. something significant happening. Right. And uh, so we we were one of the first groups to uh, jump on trying to help isolate the virus, uh, trying to develop a set of specific reagents, antibodies in this case, which we were very, very good at. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to provide tools for research institutions and companies to go out and use as diagnostics. I didn't anticipate the acceptance and use of a cross-reactive SARS-1 antibody. That's my bad. That's a great lesson for me to learn. Okay. Uh, but, but I did have a chance to sit in front of the executive committees of most, if not all, of the big players during the pandemic. And I have to tell you, absolutely appalled yeah. <laughs> at, at the types of thinking that goes on, because none of it had to do, none of it had to do with how to best protect our population what's right for the population, all of it had to do with how much money are we printing. So, so the technologies that get pushed are not often the best technologies to use. And I just for one walking, I'm not a big fan of PCR in point of care space where you need immediate results. Um, I know we're trying to work towards that because of the specificity, but we had the tools early on through rapid testing, but everybody wanted technology and everybody wanted to push these devices. We had a bunch of um, uh, machines, diagnostic machines that we saw, you know, deployed throughout the country during the pandemic. And we, we were told, oh, you can have these 15 machines to help screen your airline passengers. Uh, you don't know this, Joaquin, but I live on an island, so trying to determine who was coming in, you know, infected was really a big deal. Yeah. And those machines were so complicated, difficult to use, that they got shoved into a closet and they went for it. We're not testing anybody route yeah. uh, early yeah. on, right? So, so our technology really does, the use of it has to be appropriate. And I think the thing that really bothers me the most about any of our response is we weren't asking people with practical understanding of how this needs to be deployed what types of things we should be doing yeah. to have the biggest impact that was yeah. and uh, you know it's just it was just never those conversations never happened i was part of a working group at one point here with other mds uh, and you working with the university of washington virology group and we put together a pretty comprehensive uh, package for our local government to at least begin to understand what they were dealing with because most people don't think in terms of R-naughts and transmissions and things like that. So we, we spelled it out. Here's what's going to happen. How many people per plane are coming on this island infected? We have four ICU beds on this island. This is going to be the impact of our community. Here's how you can deal with it. Here's the testing that can, you can do. Here's the isolation types of things. They ignored all of it because it pissed off people who were afraid that it would close down their restaurants, but they couldn't have their luau's anymore or whatever it was, right? So um, it's very difficult to talk about technology use 
when we have an entire group of policymakers, decision makers, and even the general population who don't understand the implications of what you're trying to, to provide to them? It's a very difficult question. It's yes. difficult to get a man to understand the truth when his salary depends on his not understanding it. I feel it. I totally understand that. I mean, and it's a difficult decision to make too. I totally get it. And, but, you know, part of the solution would be if we had a government that actually cared about us as much as it did protecting certain unalienable rights right. or other things, we would have the social safety net that we would need to address this. And we just don't. Yeah. We just don't have it, so it's it's it becomes a free for all fend fend for yourself, and I, and I I understand the response. I don't blame them for it. It's just frustrating. Yeah, but it, it was rational in in their sort of narrow narrow way of looking at the problem. But there's no good outcome that can come of repeatedly getting sick with COVID. So it's it's ultimately damaging to the economy. Yeah, and that's yeah. something I've been screaming for several years. They did I yeah I and I literally screaming on Twitter in these video messages. <laughs> video messages I thought no one was ever going to see oh god they saw those um and they finally started reporting on it at the end of last year oh hey it's affecting the economy oh my god you're kidding me <laughs> no way but yeah, yeah we have 24 at least 24 million people with long COVID in the United States that's a pretty big number that's taking a chunk that's taking a hit on the economy and it's going to come back to taxpayer dollars yeah. It's all going to come back to taxpayer dollars. So all these, all these sort of fiscal conservatives yep. pushing this disease in, you know, in the in the interest of sort of the economy, in the interest of, of taxpayer money, um, you know, this is all going to come back to bite them. Well, well there's like um, there's short term and long term thinking, right? Yeah. That some of these. Um, when I'm thinking about okay, what, well, how how are they how are they looking at this, right? Because you know, unfortunately. Um, a lot of the people that, you know, uh, run the world and, and run finance, um, they can either bet on the economy or bet against it and make money both ways, right? Yeah. And so, um, so in, in, in the short term, right here, right, um, they're trying to squeeze out whatever they can. Th this, is, this is kind of how I interpret the decision making, right? They're trying to squeeze out whatever they can. And at the point where and you know, um, despite what you hear from you know politicians, the economy is in a bad place, um, and uh, but it could get worse, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so they're trying to squeeze out whatever they can, and then there's uh, mechanisms there for when the economy tanks that they can also make money, right? And mm -hmm. so either so so that's my interpretation of the decision making is that right. That they're trying to squeeze what they can and then also um when it does take a dip and then eventually government is going to have to step in again right through uh, stimulus packages and all these things um they they make money every which way right um and and so i think that is uh, something that we have to recognize and not think okay like it doesn't make sense that they're doing this for them financially it does make sense yeah. right because mm -hmm. Every no matter which way the economy flows, if, if stocks are going up or down, they are able to make money. Right, the the most powerful people, the people with the most money, they are able to make money um, in every scenario. And so, um, so that that's where we step in, you know, call out the truth, and and really put pressure on on getting better things implemented. But that is hard. That is so so. Even here, when you have people out on the streets and masses, right um you know decision maker there there's there's there there are so many things broken with the system right like john was mentioning the people at the table right they, they're not caring about actually taking care of the people or the communities right they're just thinking about the, the dollar if you will um and that's unfortunate so like mm -hmm. you know when when you know people like amanda and, and john and rg you all are on here uh you know my hope is that people like you um, increasingly become a more and more uh, decision making roles uh, because we need good people. It really uh, it comes down to people, right? It comes down to who the people are in decision making roles, right? When someone's in a room, and I, I know we've all been in these different rooms where um, someone pushes out an idea 
and 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 we're probably thinking that makes no sense right but because of the the personality or because of the you know uh, connections yeah, yeah. in the room they go with the bad idea right yeah. And so, and so that happens far too often, right? And so, when you see when you see a decision out there, you're like, "Who came up with that idea, right? What was discussed, right? How did that happen?" And so, yeah. um, but that's how, how that's how these things happen, right? And so, we have to get good people, good, good, good people. So, I think you know, every time, uh, so so that's kind of how how I'm operating, right? When I see good people and they're doing good work, I try to push them, elevate them. Try to support them in whichever which way so um so i think that's kind of how we start to change that but but that is a process but it's it's a process we should be conscious of right and yeah and keep trying to push forward too yeah i think that those are some great points i i also think there's a there's a there's a second way in which these things these things happen right so the black death for example caused the collapse of feudalism uh it's well known right because in, essentially too many serfs died yeah. <laughs> there were enough surfs around to keep the the you know the cogs of the feudal Sounds machine running weird. smoothly and if we end up you know essentially debilitating three quarters of the population over a decade um that's going to have dramatic consequences societal consequences that where a lot of things are on the table that really none of us wants to have on the table right i think you're seeing it with the strikes uh the strikes are the first sign um and and nobody talks about what the motivating factor is behind the strikes um, I was talking to a, to a reporter the other day at a very large national newspaper, and she told me at that newspaper, the managers have to explicitly approve the use of the word COVID in an article, uh, in the headline. Um, so there's an active attempt to kind of keep this on the, on the DL, but a lot of the strikes are really about the fact that people have too much work to do, there's not enough people, uh, and they're falling sick all the time. Uh, and of course, they, the people who are striking have been, in, to some extent, also gaslit into, hey, this is just flu, summer flu, or whatever. But this can only go on for so long. And so, what what will happen if you if you are on a collision course with reality is eventually you will bump into reality. Let's move on. Um, that'll, I'll, I'll, we'll go a little bit further, and then we'll call it a day. What excites you to persist in public health advocacy or education or advances? Loaded question. I'm not excited to You're not <laughs> in public health <laughs> advocacy. I just want my whole life back, to be honest. I just want this to be over. Right. And and you know, if if the if we had never had to work on COVID, if we had never had to publish a single paper, uh, if if I had lived in that world, that would have been a better world to live in. Right. Um, so the faster this thing gets under control, and the faster yep. we can actually have a functional life without having to ignore COVID and and then falling prey to it repeatedly, that excites me. <laughs> I think that's. Um, I'm I don't know I if that outcome will ever happen. Yeah, I will second that. I'm not excited at all. I'm I'm actually pretty horrified. I never thought that I would live through this yeah. Uh, yeah. as a microbiologist. Um, but what keeps me going is that I, there are a lot of people I care about. You know, I have a, a son in college in the world, and I want to protect him and his friends and all of you. And uh, and and that's that's really what keeps me going. Other than that, I could do without this as well. Right. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, like a world in which the grown-ups in the room were dealing with this would have been a much better world. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, brilliant answers by Arjit and John. Um, you know, I, I think about uh, the time that has, this has taken up for so many people, right? The, the, the quality of life, the lower life expectancy, and, and the time, just, just time, time. Time is the most valuable thing anyone has in this world. Um, and and it continues to be taken away here um, as this thing continues, you know. And um, you know that, that that's often I what I think about it as missed in these conversations. Um, uh, not not here, but like just like on, on Twitter and everywhere else, that the the time that's just taken away from us. Um, but you know, uh, I. I I think, you know, as we are just realists, knowing that there is a problem, knowing the consequences of it, and knowing the consequences of it, right, to ourselves and the people we care about, um, that that is why, right, like John said, right, like, um, he's protecting his his loved ones, um, and, that, and that's why I'm doing it too, right? Um, unfortunately, I am the only person in my immediate family who hasn't had COVID, um, 
and uh, you know, my parents finally got it um, this this year. Um, and um, and so, you know, uh, I try to press on them the importance of, of masking. I have you know filters where they work. Um, and at home, sometimes I'll visit their their house and the filters are off, and you know, uh, mm. you know, they get a yelling from me. Why are these filters <laughs> off? Um, and I turn them back on. Um, and so, you know, I I I know the potential uh, long term health outcomes here from having COVID with long COVID and and anything else that potentially you know that entails. Um, and um, uh, it, it's so important that you know uh, one infection is, is is one too many, and uh, reinfections just are non-starters. So we have to do as much as we can, right, to to protect our families, the people we yeah. care about. I'm gonna go rogue here. Um, I know I, I've had it. I don't know at least three times, maybe five. Who's counting at this point? And I know I'm gonna get it again because I have joint custody. Uh, he sends my son to school with no mask. Nobody wears a mask at school. I'm just biding my time until the next one and then the next one. But I think that there is a glimmer of hope in this. And I think that this is the catalyst for really desperately needed change. And I'm just gonna hold on to that. I hope you're right. I, yes, I'm, I hope so too. <laughs> I'm sort of darkly optimistic in the sense that, you know, it's that old old joke about two hunters and a bear, which is, yeah. you know, two hunters meet a bear in the woods and one starts uh, doing up his shoes and the second one goes, what's wrong with you? You never outrun a bear. And the first hunter says, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, I think if those people who are COVID cautious uh, can continue to remain COVID cautious, there's still hope for us. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, one way or the other, the path that society is taken is incredibly self-destructive. But, um, you know, limiting that self-destruction to the people who are behaving in self-destructive ways would be, you know, preferable to the extent that it's possible. And again, the right to opt out and preserving that right to opt out of the cycle of reinfection. Let the people who think that COVID is no big deal get infected as many times as they think, as they need to begin to learn that it is in fact a big deal. And then they'll come crawling over to me. Those do. The growth in the know, it's, it's so important. Um, I, I don't know what is going on here with the, um, the long COVID um, investments here from our government because, um, you know, like RG was mentioning, like if three fourths of society, you know, um, is uh, disabled by this. And it, I mean, if you do the map, that's where this potentially is headed, right? Yeah. If you do the map, it's right there. It's right there in the numbers. Um, uh, it is so urgent, so, so urgent that um, heavy, heavy, heavy investments uh, get put into, you know, potential um, uh, treatments, right? And, and, and by, by all the data, it seems like this is, you know, it's going to be different treatments because, uh, you know, one, the variants have affected people in different ways, right? Um, and then also just, you know, individuals may be affected just uh, in different ways as, as well. So, um, but, but it's not there, right? The investment is, is not there. The, uh, the urgency isn't there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm kind of stunned. Uh, I saw that, you know, Tim Kaine, who's introduced, you know, a long COVID bill, um, also uh, supported uh, a bill um, to prevent uh, masking, I believe, in public transit, right? Um, and, I, and I think to myself, like, how, why? why like, why, why, why are you doing that? Uh, you you holler, stop long COVID. Um, you, you know how, how bad it can be, um, you know, at least to a certain extent, right? Everyone has different variations of it. Um, and, but, you know, the, the number one thing we can do for long COVID right now that we have control of is is preventing reinfections, right? That's the most That's thing right. we have control over, That's right? The That's the most have, yeah. thing and lowest lowest hanging fruit. Lowest hanging if fruit. we can't even do that, yeah. right? Um, you know, I, I I don't know where these people's heads are at, right? I, yeah. I don't know what what they're thinking. I don't know, like, is he? And I, I'm thinking in the in him being a politician is like, is he supporting that bill in order to get support on something else? Like what, what's yeah. even going on there, right? Or is he just kind of oblivious to how these things are contradictory? I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, on its face, it just it doesn't make sense, right? Um, yeah, we, we need huge billions, billions, billions of dollars, uh, right? A huge upfront billions, right? 
um, in order to tackle this. And then you could do like you know, whatever so, later on as, as a steady amount. But right now you need, you need huge, like let's solve this within the next, you know, three years, right? Right. Or less, right? Or like less. that's, that's gotta be the, the, the moonshot, right? Yeah. Think... Just to put it in context, I mean, um, uh, you know, a Gerald Ford aircraft carrier costs 13 billion. Um, the Ukraine aid was 80 billion. So we're not talking a lot of money. Five trillion was spent on the pandemic. Out of that five trillion, 30 billion was earmarked for um, earmarked for um, walk by speed, and 500 million went to um, to therapeutics. If you looked at the the cost of doing in, improved indoor air quality for the entire country, it would probably be in the ballpark of 30 billion or 50 billion numbers that small. They are small numbers for, for the federal government. So everyone talks about huge investments, but they are only huge compared to, uh, that's not the right yardstick. They are a fraction, they're, they're a fraction of a penny compared to what the damage long COVID will do to the economy. And I think the one thing that no one ever brings into this conversation, and it really, it's still the number one most frustrating thing for me. And the first thing I tell every politician I talk to, we need socioeconomic support. You can talk about research and treatment all you want. If you are dead in a tent, it doesn't matter. Get them out of the tent. Mm -hmm. Or prevent them from getting into the tent in the first place. Prevention is far cheaper. Keep them housed, mm -hmm. keep them fed, keep them with access to health care. It's far cheaper. But they don't want it. Nobody ever, nobody, nobody addresses that. Yeah. And, and you know, when it comes to things like treatments, right? I have worked in pharma my whole career. It is phenomenally difficult to yeah. make to build treatments for chronic diseases. Yes. So mm -hmm. if if our backstop is by golly, we'll just you know and we'll just fix long COVID uh, with a, with a new drug, that's really uh, people are deluding themselves, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. and pharma is not excited about long COVID. If you if you notice, they've already gotten bitten really hard with Alzheimer's. So in pharma in general, there's not it's not like this gold rush mentality about long COVID. In fact, most of pharma is in the throes of denial about COVID to begin with. Well, I think um, the big thing that we're forgetting with this is that long COVID is an umbrella term. It's not really exactly. a diagnosis. There it's will not, not be a cure for long COVID. That's not how this works. You need to address the individual needs that are going on. That yeah. we can do. Yeah. Just anytime I hear the word cure, I'm like, no, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm out of this. Yeah, it's, it's like whole rooms full of people blowing cigarette smoke at each other, talking yeah. about cures for lung cancer. It doesn't, it's not it's a really smart no, way to do it. Works. Right, right. Any final thoughts before I press that little red button? Well, yeah, I just want to thank you, Amanda, uh, yeah. for just, um, you know, you, you yourself are going through long COVID and, and you've been a champion for so many people um, and, and such a such a fierce advocate. Um, and um, yeah, I just uh, appreciate you bringing us all together and, you know, our, our yeah. Oh. Uh, on uh, on on Twitter, and I appreciate all, all the work you've been doing, and, and just your honesty and uh, the the research you're doing, and and, and John, and this is my first time, first introduction to John, so uh, it's it's a pleasure to hear from you, John, and, and to meet you, and, and to know the work uh, that you've done. Um, so uh, so that's that's it for me. I think uh, I think for people, you know, uh, the the hope is just it, it's us. The hope is you, right? Who is listening at home? Right uh, to just uh, to just keep going, right, and um, um, and to support one another, um, and to know that you know with us supporting each other, uh, we will help each other get those resources, right, little by little. If 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 that it has to be the way, um, you know. Um, uh, but it, we are going. We are. It's it's so abundantly obvious that it's not going to be these politicians that are going to get us out of this mess. It's going to be our efforts, um, despite their uh, denial or or their lack of care or whatever the case is going on. Right. So it, it's just it's just going to be all us. So believe in believe in yourself. If you're listening at home, believe in yourself. Right. Believe in those people that you see caring, um, and um, and you know, working together and, and putting that pressure up and, and holding people accountable, right? Call it out, right? Just call it out. If, if politicians are doing the wrong thing, call it out, right? Because um, light, you know, transparency, this is what is going to help um, bring this, um, 
this lack of care, this lack of urgency out of the shadows, right? And that that's that's what we really need. Yeah, monsters are easier to face in the light than they are that are. Mm -hmm. John, final thoughts. Yeah, thank you again for bringing us together. It's thank always you. awesome meeting uh, driven people as well, Keen and Erdit. And uh, I, I just want to say, um, you know, keeping informed. Yeah. <laughs> Information is power. And there are great sources out there, including people here on this panel and yourself. Um, there's no shortage of good information out there. So if people are struggling to understand where they fit in this really complex scenario, we, we have the information in front of us. And uh, so I, I appreciate you again, you bringing us to the table and uh, final thought is biology is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a reason we went to school for many years to do this. So this isn't, these aren't simple things, but there are those of us out there who understand this in ways that we're happy to, to contribute in forums like this. So thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. All right, Jean, go for it. Yeah, thanks for having, having me as always, Amanda. This is always interesting. I, I enjoy our conversations. I've enjoyed uh, getting to meet you, John, and I, I'm a fan of yours, Joaquin. So I mean, it's nice to finally meet you and uh, meet you. Um, <laughs> And these conversations, frankly, are, are helpful at, for me at a personal level to know, you know, you're not crazy. Um, it's validating, right? Because we all go through this. And for, if, if you're listening at home, uh, hang in there, because this is not over. The historical arc of pandemics is, is unpredictable. And um, all options are on the table for a virus that's evolving rapidly and has been, you know, where the decision has been to ignore it. Uh, there's a huge, uh, you know, there's a huge set of like tail, tail end outcomes that are not pleasant. So all options are on the table, uh, stay strong because it's you have a right to not be infected. It's bodily autonomy issues. So never be afraid, never be ashamed of saying, hey, I don't want to get infected. Because uh, ultimately the fewer times we all get infected, the faster we can let those people who think that this is not a big deal, figure out that it is in fact a big deal. Uh, so, you know, fighting for that right to opt out is really crucial. Uh, and keeping that sort of men mental um, strength to say, I'm not doing this. Uh, I don't care if you think I look funny with my dog mask or my platypus mask, I'm not doing this, uh, is important. And, and so, you know, stay strong because again, it is still a solvable problem. All that it takes is the political will and the political will will come when enough of a societal price is paid. We shouldn't be the ones who have to pay that price. So, you know, it's a stop tail paradox, which is never confused you know, the, the belief that you will prevail with uh, prevail in the end um, with the strength to confront the most brutal facts. Uh, so it's it, it comes down to that. I think we all need to be realistic about what's happening. It's not going to get better by itself, but we also all need to stay strong because there is light at the end of the tunnel if we can hold up. Well, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to click this little red button now. Actually, two red buttons. Yeah, nice meeting you guys. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad it's still recording. Sorry. Right.